I love cooking and I love teaching people how to cook. I've been doing both for 30 years. To cook well, it helps if you love and value food, as that is where it all starts. My approach to cooking is simple and not new. Use the best ingredients you can, get organised and follow the recipe. That way, you'll be sure to get wonderful results. Soups are great. I mean, you could eat a different soup every day of the year and not begin to scratch the surface on the amount of recipes that are available. They can be thick, thin, complicated or very simple. A simple recipe though like this for a vegetable soup should not be a way of using up your leftover vegetables because remember, tired vegetables in your vegetable rack will actually yield a slightly exhausted soup. So simplicity, freshness of flavour, freshness of ingredients, really remarkable results. So I'm ready to prepare my green vegetable soup. And today, the green vegetable of choice is spinach, even though it could be cabbage, peas, cucumbers, all sorts of different things. And this is a formula, a master recipe if you want. I've got one cup of potatoes, some onions, some stock, and then my spinach. But we start off this recipe always by sweating the potato and the onion. So the potato has just been diced like that. And in my saucepan over here, I've got my butter melting. So we'll pop in the onions into the foaming butter, then add the potatoes. A pinch of salt and a twist of black or two of black pepper. It should do it. So coating the vegetables in the butter so there are no dry bits of onion or a potato. And then a little extra insulation in the form of a butter wrapper, or it could be a bit of grease proof or parchment paper, but that will help to hold in the steam. And it gets a lovely, it's like a little sauna for the vegetables and it just softens out their flavor and tenderizes them. So while the potatoes and onions are sweating there on the gentle heat, I'm going to prepare the spinach. And for this recipe, I don't want that stalk, I just want the green leaves. To remove the stalk, just fold the leaf back over itself and then just pull out the stalk, just the tough stalks. If you were making this with baby spinach, by the way, this tiny little leaf, sometimes called pousse, you don't need to de-stalk those, you could just put those in stalks and all. So that should be my quantity ready to go. And that, I know, looks like a lot of spinach, but that will collapse down. So let's see how our vegetables are doing. You see the way if I press the, see the way the potato there is just starting to break down? That's perfect. The other really important ingredient in this particular recipe is chicken stock. Place the lid on the saucepan and turn up the heat. Cook on a gentle simmer until the potatoes and onions are cooked completely through. To check that your vegetable is cooked, Simply press a piece against the lid of the saucepan and if it breaks up like this, then you know it's ready. Now, as I said, it looks like a lot of spinach, but just bear with it and it will start to collapse down and wilt. I know it looks unlikely and you're thinking that I'm not going to get the rest of my spinach in here, but look, see the way it's even starting to wilt down. Now, what's really, really important is we do not put the saucepan lid back on the pan. And that rule applies to any green vegetable soup you're making. In fact, it applies whenever you're cooking a green vegetable. Because if you put the lid back on the saucepan, um, when the uh, liquid comes back to a simmer, it, they, it rises up in steam and condenses on the underside of the lid, falls back in, and for some reason or other, that takes the lovely green colour out of the soup. And when you lose the green colour, generally speaking, you also you lose some of that lovely, fresh, just picked flavour. OK, so I think my spinach is cooked, so I'm going to turn off the heat and just take a little out onto my saucepan lid. And my spoon just goes through it there very easily like that. So I know that the spinach is tender. So I need to liquidise it or blend it, whichever you like to do, straight away. OK, that's it. Um, lovely and smooth, silky, not a particularly thick soup, but because this is so full of spinachy flavour, I don't want it so thick. You see how deeply coloured that soup is? I mean, that's a colour you'd be proud of, I think, hopefully on St. Patrick's Day, or any day of the year for that matter. I'm going to serve some of the soup with just a tiny little blob of cream. It just gives a little sort of rich lift to it at the very last moment. The other ingredient you might think is unusual in a soup like this is a slice of black pudding, which I've just warmed up in the pan. 
And that sort of descends to the bottom and comes as a little surprise to your guests when they're eating it. The other thing that will be wonderful is chorizo. So pop a couple of slices of that in. So there is a lovely formula that you can use all year round to produce a variety of nourishing and delicious soups. Most people love a roast. A quality piece of meat cooked on the bone and generally with the skin still on. And you know, after the Sunday roast has been consumed and you have all the lovely bits of potatoes and vegetables to go with that, there's a sort of a calm that descends on the house, which is a thing of beauty, really. Monday's tomorrow, not yet to be worried about. However, the key to that good, wonderful, calm feeling is really in the quality of the ingredients. So plan ahead, do a bit of good shopping, buy a nice quality piece of meat, treat it simply, you will be amply rewarded with food that pleasures everybody in the house. A leg of spring lamb is an expensive treat. And depending on what part of the country you live in, um, that will determine the flavour of the lamb. So this beautiful, so quality assured leg of lamb has just been slightly prepared for me by my butcher. So what I'm going to do though, is just make a few small little cuts in the top of the lamb like that. You'll notice I'm not going into the flesh there. I'm just encouraging some of the excess fat to run out. And when the fat runs out of the meat, during the cooking process, it bastes it and makes it even more delicious. So just a few more little cuts. At this time of the year, I like to put nothing other than salt and pepper on the lamb. As the lamb gets older, as we progress through the year and they get slightly bigger, the flavor develops and it becomes stronger. But now when it's sweet, succulent and delicious, absolutely at its prime, salt and pepper, nothing else. I've preheated my oven to 180, so we'll pop it in. While it's roasting, you have time to do other things. This is a very, very simple thing. Just some mint leaves. So we'll chop the mint. The other interesting thing about mint when you chop it is it oxidizes really quickly. So you've got to preserve it. So the lemon juice and the sugar that we're going to mix it with will preserve it. That's really quite important. That's perfect. So I'm going to add, as I said, a little bit of lemon juice to it and also a little bit of sugar. So I'm just going to flick out the pips there and squeeze in the lemon juice. This is really a take on the old fashioned mint sauce. So just pop in a little bit of sugar like that and then mix it around. Now what I need to do is to taste this. So this is really fresh tasting. It tastes just like spring. You know, the new season herbs just starting to jump out of the ground. That's going to be perfect with the lamb. Right, here we go. So for our chickpea puree, we're making really a type of hummus really here. And another day you'd want maybe roast potatoes with the lamb or new potatoes if they're in would be lovely. But I'm going in a slightly different sort of Middle Eastern uh, direction with the, the starch, if you like, to serve with the lamb. So I'm using chickpeas. And these are the little dried chickpeas. And then all we do is we put them in a bowl and cover them with cold water and ideally leave them overnight. And you can see it's remarkable the way they swell in size as they soak up the water. You can use tinned pre-cooked chickpeas here if you want. I have to say, I prefer the cleaner, fresher ta uh, taste and flavor of the ones where you start dry and soak them overnight. This must be strained off. And then we cook the chickpeas again in fresh water. Fresh water in there, about two centimeters proud of the surface of the chickpeas, and then just lid on. And I'm going to cook these for about approximately 30 minutes. But the really important thing is we cook them until they're really tender. Once the chickpeas are fully cooked, drain them keeping some of the liquid they were cooked in. Put them into a food processor, add some cumin and then some crushed garlic. Spoon in some tahini, which is the paste made from sesame seeds. Add just a little of the cooking liquid, not too much. You can always add some more later. Finally, squeeze in some lemon juice, then blitz. Right, let's have a look. Yeah, it's still a bit firm looking. So I've used all of the water I drained off the chickpeas for cooking, but now I'm going to use what's sometimes called the forgotten ingredient in the kitchen, water. 
So just put a little dribble in and we'll whiz it again. And you can hear the sand change completely when I added in the little bit of water. And now it's getting nice and creamy looking, much, much more like a sort of a hummus. A couple of remaining ingredients that need to go in are chopped coriander. And so far, I haven't added in any salt or pepper because when we're cooking the chickpeas, we deliberately didn't put in salt in because we didn't want to toughen the chickpea. And also, if you put salt in with the chickpeas when they're cooking, sometimes it lo loosens the skin. It's not the end of the world when you're making a puree, but if you were making a chickpea salad, it's nice to have the skins intact. So a pinch of salt, like that, a little bit of pepper, OK, it certainly looks good. Consistency, I'm happy with that. Just lovely and creamy and soft, a sort of a light flowing consistency. See the way it just sort of flows like that? That's the consistency I want. That's my hummus and the mint relish ready. To go with the lamb, we need to prepare a rich gravy, and that's coming up after the break with other good things. Good. What's very important with the lamb is to know how to test it, see it's cooked to your liking. So what I like to do is to insert the skewer into the thickest part of the meat, sort of about there, and don't, not in as far as the bone, and count two, three, four, five, five seconds, and then just very quickly, just touch it against your arm there, and the heat of the skewer will tell you exactly what's happening inside. So in other words, when I did that, this feels quite hot now, so mine is sort of medium well, the lamb, just a little bit of pink in the middle, which is the way I like it. I'm going to take the lamb off here and just put it back into an oven. I'm going to turn my oven here to um, this oven here to 50 degrees, because this lamb will eat better and carve better in half an hour than it will now. Now, what have I got in my roasting tray? Beautiful things. I have a mixture of lamb fat, and lamb juice. And once you know how to make one gravy for lamb like we're doing today, well then it's easy. You just do exactly the same thing for chicken and beef and pork. So I'm going to pour those in there for a moment and I'm just going to allow them to relax, to allow the fat to rise to the surface of the liquid. It's like oil and water on a puddle. It's exactly the same principle. So now I roast and tray nice and hot. So I'm going to add in my liquid, which in this case today is chicken stock. It could be lamb stock as well if you want to, but honestly, personally, I find chicken stock is much more interesting than lamb stock. What we want to do is scrape the bottom of the tray and loosen up any of the little bits of caramelised meat juice that are in there, because that, again, that's the essence. That's when the juice has come out of the lamb when it was cooking and has hit the bottom of the pan and has caramelised. And that's a lovely intensity of flavour. Decant everything into a smaller saucepan. This makes it much easier to deal with. Add a pinch of salt and a twist of pepper. And that's not quite it, by the way, because we still have this fabulous stuff in here. This is where the intensity of flavour is. You see, we've got about a centimetre of fat on there, uh, which we don't want in the gravy. I'm going to use this little guy. This is called a maigret, and every house should have one. And as you can see, it looks like a little jug that's got two spouts, one at either end. And then when we put this liquid in here, allow it to sit again for a moment to allow the fat to rise to the surface. Pour to the end with the funnel and just keep pouring until you see the fat coming through. And then you know you've got as much of those juice out of there as is possible. That essentially is gravy making. a lot of work but you will absolutely be repaid for your efforts by a really really delicious meal mm. 
I like my cake fresh, and I'm talking the same day fresh, and then I love cake. Nothing compares to the texture, flavour and smell of a cake eaten on the same day it is baked. For the cook, there's a satisfaction the moment you open the oven door to reveal a beautiful cake, perfectly risen, perfectly coloured. It makes me sigh with pleasure, and that pleasure is compounded on presentation of the cake to family and friends. So I'm starting to make my, what I call a plain cake here, which is underselling the cake, really. You could, of course, call it a tea cake as well if you want to. And it's a beautiful cake for serving with a cup of tea or a cup of coffee. I'm actually going to serve it as a dessert cake today, adding a little strawberries and creme anglaise and custard to the picture. Let's take that off. I've had my eggs and my sugar um, beating for about 10, 10 to 12 minutes and they start to hold a sort of a, a vague figure of eight on top like that. It won't hold a really firm figure of eight like a classic whisked up sponge. And that's the thing about this cake, it's sort of a mixture of a Victoria sponge and a classic whisked up sponge. So at some stages it will look unlike any other cake you've ever made perhaps. Um, so three teaspoons of baking powder, just normal uh, teaspoon sizes. And when you sieve the flour, you, you know, you're getting a little bit more air into the cake, which is terrific. So I've also got some butter, which I've just sort of melted gently like that and allowed to cool down. And when you're making a cake, um, you can obviously make cakes with olive oil and other types of fat, but butter just brings the most delicious flavour. And then I'm going to add in my flour. And in this case, I'm going to just drop the flour on gently, all in one go like that. And the other element I need to put in now is a little lemon zest. Sometimes I use an orange in here to flavour the cake, or it could be a lime for that matter, or a mixture of citrus. Or you could put in a pinch of cinnamon, you could ring the changes with this. Now we're going to fold all that in. And the folding technique is just cutting down through the middle and folding the spatula over, then give the bowl a, a sort of quarter, 90 degree turn, and repeat. Okay, keep folding until it's pretty much completely folded in. Now, it's starting to look kind of nearly like a Victoria sponge at this stage. That sort of consistency, nicely folded in. So I'm going to add in my vanilla, one teaspoon, straight into the milk and the cream. So we're going to pour in the milk and the cream in increments. We're actually going to end up with what looks like a batter. And again, look at the two completely different consistencies here. You've got the really heavy cake mixture, and then we've got, you know, the liquid cream and milk. And you think, ne'er the twain shall meet. Well, actually, you're in control of the situation, so you're going to bring them together. So now, a little more of our milk and cream. But I can smell the aroma of the vanilla. It's not quite like being in Madagascar, but, you know, you have to dream. So the reason I've been adding in the milk in increments is because if you pour all of the milk in in one go, it's actually more difficult and it takes longer to get it to mix. And also, there's a possibility of it curdling. So the last of the cream, milk and vanilla going in. So keep at it. You could do this on the machine, but I really prefer to do it by hand like this. And that is now perfect. So that sort of batter type of consistency. Then nice and gently, just pour in. Right, there we go. Scrape everything out nicely. So about sort of coming up maybe not quite two thirds along the tin at this stage and into my preheated oven. And that's going to cook for about 40 minutes. So the cake is cooking away there nicely. While it's finishing cooking, I'm going to make the little crème anglaise or light custard to serve with this. I've had my milk infusing with a vanilla pod. So I brought that just to simmering point and then turned off the heat and it's sitting in there. So flavour's coming out of the vanilla pod and into the milk. So that's resting for a moment. In here I've got my egg yolks and I'm going to add some caster sugar. And I'm going to whisk this up and get it nice and light. OK, so you can see it's changed colour, it's somewhat lighter. And now we're ready to add in the milk. So, a spoon. I usually just shoot the vanilla pod in with the milk, but just add the milk in just slowly to start off with. Just in case the milk is still holding too much heat, you don't want to scramble your egg yolk. 
So I'm putting it into a low-sided saucepan here so I can see exactly what's going on. So it's very thin. And this custard, even when it's cooked, isn't going to become very thick. So back on a fairly low heat. And I've got a flat-bottomed wooden spoon. And I'm going to just keep traipsing backwards and forwards with my spoon, not allowing the mixture to sit undisturbed for any length of time in one place on the bottom of the saucepan where it might get a chance to sort of cook a bit further and scramble. And look how thin it is at this stage. And the thing with creme anglaise, and people are sometimes surprised by this, it doesn't thicken an awful lot. Most of the thickening with creme anglaise happens when it cools, and that's one of the reasons why we make it a little bit ahead of time. So don't expect anything dramatic to happen here. This is going to take about 10 minutes, so you can have a little sort of zen moment. Uh, don't get yourself into too much of a trance, because don't forget what's going on in here. OK, it's there. It's just taken very, very lightly. And if I pull my a finger through it like that, it just leaves a light sort of trail of my finger behind. It's not going to be thick like a custard that's been flour thickened. So I like to sieve it and get it out of the saucepan straight away, like that. Now, slit the vanilla bean in half, push some of the seeds out, the tiny little minuscule seeds, with the back of the knife, and this will add enormously to the intensity of the flavour. Give that a quick whisk to thoroughly blend in the vanilla seeds. And that is a perfect lump-free consistency at this stage. OK, let's test our cake, because I think our cake could be ready. And I'm using a little fancy little thing called a little cake tester. So pop it into the middle like that and take it out. And the skewer should come out absolutely clean like that. So that's ready. And I know it's cooked. This cake almost always has a big smile on top, by the way. And that is something that gives me cheer rather than alarm. And it will happen to you as well. It's just one of those cakes that breaks into a big smile in the cooking. Place the cake on a wire rack. Once it has cooled, but is still slightly warm, it's ready to serve. So the first slice, by the way, is always the cooked slice. So a little serrated knife. So that's the bit you have yourself. It's for me in a moment. Then I'm going to cut a thickish slice, maybe not quite an inch. This is almost, you know, in a way, like a sort of a, a warm trifle. So some strawberries, like that. Then a dollop of softly whipped cream. So, you know, you're not going to be having this every day. It's a treat. A little sprig of mint. And then finally, just a little drizzle of our custard over like that. And that should be just a joy to eat.